Hello, everyone, and welcome to in the Ingenia Lifestyle and Starts at 60 Downsizing webinar. I'm Christine Sieb, I'm your host today. Um, so thank you so much for joining us to discuss downsizing and how to create a roadmap to make the downsizing decision that's right for you. Um, today, we have three great guest presenters who are really familiar with the downsizing process. They're here to share their insights on how you can make downsizing work for you, not just financially, but emotionally and socially. Um, you'll probably recognize Noel Whitaker from previous webinars and his appearances on TV and in newspapers. Noel's written 22 books. He's a chartered tax accountant and he's the adjunct professor with the Faculty of Business at the Queensland University of Technology. Um, you'll also recognize Rachel Lane. Uh, Rachel's joined us on um, previous webinars and been super helpful. Rachel's the principal of Village Gurus, an award-winning author, and she oversees an Australia-wide network of financial advisors who are committed to putting clients first with quality advice on the financial aspects of downsizing and retirement living. Rachel, like Noel, is an independent expert who is not affiliated with any product provider. And we also have Kate Melrose. Kate has over 25 years of experience in the property sector, creating medium to large scale communities. And she's truly passionate about providing innovative, innovative and integrated living solutions for Australians aged over 55. She's currently the general manager of sales at Ingenia Lifestyle, our partner on this webinar. And she's interviewed thousands of downsizers to understand their needs as part of her role. I'd like to thank you all very much for joining us today. Um, we know that downsizing is a big milestone in the lives of many of our community members and having experts like yourselves um, make yourself available um, online to talk through the various considerations is really helpful. Um, first though, I'd like to pass, um, pass over to Kate. Um, Kate's here to talk you, to you about why it's important to start planning your downsizing journey so you can take control of your future and have the outcome that aligns with your life goals. Kate. Thanks, Christine, and a very good morning to everybody. And thank you for taking a bit of time to, out of your day to start to think about um, what, what your life could look like if you considered your options. Um, some of you are joining us today because you're just starting a bit of a journey on downsizing. Some of you have been looking around and considering your options, but I think the reality is COVID has challenged all of us. Um, some of us over the last few months have spent some unprecedented time away from family and away from friends and, and, and have had to be forced to withdraw from some of those great social engagements and activities. Um, and spent more than normal time sitting looking at the walls of your home. And, um, and for some people, that is a little overwhelming with the amount of maintenance and upkeep. So um, look, we've got a couple of goals today. Our goal is really to bring together some really knowledgeable insights and hopefully to give you, raise some questions, open some dialogue, and to equip you with some really good quality information that might help you this Christmas have some really interesting dialogues, um, either with yourself, your partner or your family, about what, what would great look like for you this time next year? What, does, what, what is life ahead for you? And has COVID changed what you're seeking in life? Um, change can be confronting. And I think retirement and downsizing is no different to some of those big life changes that we all face. But um, what we see all the time is, People's anxiety around change significantly reduces when they start to get into the driver's seat. They start to consider their options. And even if the outcome of after going on a journey is that um, staying in your home is the right thing for you and your family, what actually happens in that is it becomes a deliberate decision and your anxiety and your sense of ownership and your sense of control of this next chapter really escalates and your enjoyment of it um, escalates. So whatever the decision is right for you. Our goal today is just to give you some great information, give you a bit of a roadmap with it to help you decide, do I stay at home? Do I move? What would happen if I cash out and would really privileged to have Noel today? What's your financial future if you were to make a move? What would that do to your pension or your super fund? And one of the things we look forward to sharing with you after this is a bit of a roadmap that can help you sit down with a cuppa and assess it. But um, you know, I often say there's three components to downsizing. It's the financial element, which is always so important. 
that physical downsize, the actual declutter and um, and and physically moving is is quite immense. Um, but it's also the emotional downsides. Um, you know, leaving a family home that's full of so many amazing memories is something else that people have to start to think through and realise, well, you know, the memories do come with me if I choose that downsizing is an option for me. So hopefully we will open a few dialogues and, you know, maybe prompt you to think about the conversations you might have with family this Christmas um, about your next chapter. So Noel will talk to us about taking control of your financial future. Rachel, um, as Christine's referred, is an absolute expert on downsizing options. We'll talk us through the pros and cons of, of those. And we also have a really great special guest. Many of you often think I'd love to be able to hear from somebody who's already made the decision, that's walked this journey ahead of me. And so we're really privileged to have today with us Di from one of our uh, Ingenious Lara communities who will share with you her journey and what drove her decisions what her experience has been, some of the trials and tribulations and some of the good, the bad and the ugly, hopefully. Um, I think one of the things that is certain is Australia, like the rest of the world, is facing a tidal wave of downsizes. Baby boomers, like they have everything that they've done through their life, they're changing, they're driving change in industry and sector. And what's exciting is as baby boomers are more discerning, they're very particular about what they're going to want in this next chapter, and what we're seeing is industries responding with great innovation, which is exciting. Boomers are probably questioning, do I want to pay an exit fee? Um, and so what we're seeing is an emerging demand. We're seeing industry innovate and respond. We are seeing off the back of some great research that's just come out of DCM, a real imbalance of supply and demand. And as a sector, um, we need to increase more innovation and more supply to cater to the tidal wave coming through. Okay, do you think um, that COVID itself has changed people's outlook and uh, appetite for downsizing? Look, I think it's very much changed the psyche. Uh, we've never faced so much um, social isolation and where humans are very tribal beings. We need to connect and belong and our health and wellness is absolutely paramount to being able to have those social connections. And a lot of people have lost that. A lot of people today are sitting at home They've stopped their golf, they've stopped their bowling, they've stopped seeing friends and family as frequently. And, you know, there is a little impact on their confidence around that. So, you know, people have to deliberately start to reach out and connect again. And um, so I think we've seen an increased appetite for community living, for social connection, family connection, um, and a very big focus on health and wellbeing. I think COVID has really challenged um, and given us a sense of vulnerability around our health. And I think people will really start to seek longevity. And, you know, I, I'm, I'm delighted to see innovation in industry, in lifestyle communities and some others, some of our other competitors that are really innovating in the health and wellness um, space, preventative health, and really underpinning people's longevity in some of that innovation. So, you know, I think there definitely has been a change in the biopsyche. Um, and it's great to hear about that kind of innovation, but um, it can also, you've got more options. That's uh, more things to think about. Some people um, right back at the start get um, are wondering about the difference between say, what's a retirement community or a retirement village? What's age care? What's lifestyle community or land lease community? Can you spell out how to think of the key differences? Absolutely. I think the thing to understand is there is more choice available. I think people think, put it all together, aged care, retirement, lifestyle communities, over 50, it's all bundled and it does cause a little bit of confusion for people. So a quick snapshot is aged care is, is all care. It's, it's, it's about health needs and it's normally a driven decision and I think off the back of COVID, nobody's putting up their hand saying, I want to go to aged care. Traditionally, people are not entering aged care till they're about 85 and they've got real health needs. Retirement communities are a traditional model that people have been more familiar with. But we are, have seen over the last 10 years, people average age of entry really, really later and they're deferring that decision. What is fascinating, though, is baby boomers are coming through, having recently put mum and dad in aged care who may not have been proactive about taking control of that next chapter. And there's actually real reverse. So boomers are coming through saying, hang on, my kids aren't putting me anywhere. 
I'm going to take control of it. And when I do, I want choice and I want control and I want flexibility in, in the option that I look at. And Rachel will talk us through a little more the differences between a retirement community and a lifestyle community and this emerging sector that is, is now the fastest growing downsize option um, for retirees is a much simpler model that's responded to some of the feedback that people have said they want a really simple, flexible solution. Um, I, there's a bit of confusion because there's a lifestyle community, there's over 55s, um, there's um, lots of names called for it. Um, some of them do have an exit fee, particularly in Victoria. Um, Ingenia's model doesn't, it's quite a simple model, but Rachel will talk to that in a little more detail um, later in the session. But I think the thing that people do have to go into it considering is, you know, what, what am I looking for? What, what is the driving me? Is it that I want a home that's simple and I can move into and it's light and airy, um, good entertaining spaces, I can lock and leave? Um, and I think we've got a couple of images here of some of those, some of the innovations of what new lifestyle communities are starting to look like. Um, you know, what are the facilities I want? Is there space that I want to be able to host friends and family at home? And I want the kids and the grandkids to come over and really want to enjoy being with me. So it is important to consider, you know, how homes are designed if you're going to downsize. Um, what's the place like? What can I afford? Um, where do I want to live? And, and really getting a bit of a roadmap together. And I think if we want to achieve anything today, it's about giving you a sense of what are the next steps. Um, you know, we've got a little bit of a taste in the next few slides, which we might quickly, quick flick through. Um, but a lot of innovation is going into really innovative design in this space. And I think the perception of downsizing into a drab small space is very much a thing of the past. Um, there's resort staff facilities with great pools, really great resort facilities that are a canvas for people to come together and both bring the depth of life experience or the opportunity to start new and innovative skills, start new things, tick off the bucket list, and also that appetite to be able to just lock and leave without a concern and a worry. Now, maybe people aren't travelling overseas and um, maybe not cruising is on the agenda at the moment, but caravan acquisitions and purchases have gone through the roof in Australia through COVID. So um, our, our sister business, the Holiday Park, is very, very busy. So I think we're seeing a shift very much in what people are aspiring to and then wanting simpler life, a lot more fun and want to take control of that next chapter a little bit more. And we're seeing them do it earlier. Um, that's, this is that's... just one slide, a taste of a day in the life. Um, and, and again, it's about people doing as much or as little as they want to do in, in, in their retirement. It, it really is about that control and choice. Um, but it is a lovely thing to be able to pop out the front door, bump into someone walking the dog, pop down to the clubhouse, do a yoga or an exercise class. Um, you know, some of the great things, we've got a yacht club at one of our communities of remote yachts. Um, just the power and happiness and health and wellness that comes from connecting with like-minded people is, um, is a very big factor in deciding what you want as you move forward. The, the, of course, the other big factor is, um, as as we always know, is your finances. And I know that um, that uh, Noel is going to talk a little more about that. But Kate, is there anything you would like to say around the financial options within Ingenia Lifestyle before we ask Noel about the the bigger picture? Yes, for sure. Look, Ingenia spent Ingenia is a publicly listed company. We're listed on the Australian Stock Exchange. We're probably the largest creator of lifestyle communities in Australia. And um, we partner with a company from the US, Sun Communities, who are the leader in, in this in the US. But it's pretty simple. We spend a lot of time listening to, it, to people. And I think I've personally interviewed three, three and a half thousand. So it's do your shopping, do your homework, do understand. Our model is very simple. There's no entry fees, no stamp duty, no exit fees. Not all lifestyle communities are the same. So do do your homework. Um, but, you know, Rachel will talk you through some of the critical things that you've got to consider. But one of the key things um, Noel would talk to is how much money do you want in the bank? Because that's how much, how much better you're going to sleep at night. Um, so it's a bit about talk to an agent, find out what your home's worth, understand if you've got any other assets or if you're a pensioner and 
decide how much money do I want in the bank um, to tick off that bucket list and really start to enjoy life. So, um, you know, I'll leave that to Noel to talk to. He's the absolute expert in, in equity release and, and what people should be doing in this low interest rate environment um, if they were to sell, sell their home and, um, and move into a lifestyle community. That is a great point. Um, that's a great point at which we should go to Noel. Noel, can you talk us through how, how a downsizer can use this change to take control of their financial future and also um, have an idea around um, perhaps when they might want to time that within their retirement? Okay, I guess the big picture thing is that the retirement income review, which has just been published, makes it very clear that the government is going to expect you to live off your savings. House is part of your resources. And the superannuation system is not meant to be a piggy bank where you can keep the money for your family after you die. To cut it short, they expect you to use your house. Now, a major, everyone wants to know how much money we need, but the major factor which concerns how much you will have, how long you'll, how much you'll have when you get to retirement, and how long your money will last, is the rate of return you can achieve. And you can see on, on that slide at 5%, at 84, you're out of money, and at 8%, 99. So getting that, the best return on your money is one of the most important things to consider. Now, you either downsize because you've got no option or you want to do it. Now, many people, need, the government expects you to release the equity in your home. There's two ways to do this. You either sell the home and downsize, or you take out a reverse mortgage. Now, the trouble with the reverse mortgage is that you're paying interest on interest. There are no repayments of principal or interest. So every 12 years, your debt will double. So I think a reverse mortgage should be the last option for most people. We go back to downsizing. You may have plenty of money, but you're sick of all the maintenance of a great big home. Now, that's a good reason to downsize anyway. And if you've got plenty of money, the age pension isn't going to bother you. But I think you need to be careful that if the house is costing increasing maintenance and you keep putting off the decision you reach a stage that may cost you $100,000 in repair bills to sell the house. And you may be caught that you can't afford to, to pay what you need to pay to sell your house. Now, also now there are great innovative products called monthly income stream, life, lifestyle income streams, where part of your downsizing proceeds can be used to purchase a special kind of lifetime annuity and only 60% of that counts for the asset test. And this means what you do then is you get a much better pension and also a pension for, and also an annuity pension for life. And that's one of the best things I think for retirees to gain downsizing. Thanks, Noel. What would you say to that, Kate, about the, uh, or, or, or Noel, have you got anything more you could say about the timing, when, when to do it? Well, I think it's better to do it sooner rather than later. I remember my wife's parents, they thought about downsizing, they thought about it and thought about it, then they got to their 80s, and then, and then they didn't because it was dead too much trouble, and then he died and she was left alone, a lonely old bitter lady in a depreciating home. That's what you don't want. One of the most important th things about life uh, retirement happiness is your social network. And I think the worst thing for a, a social network is be a lonely person left in an old rambling, falling down home. That could be a living hell. That does not sound fun. And that's not something we would wish to wish for anyone. Um, Kate, you are talking to a lot of downsizers and you, you have in the past. Are you getting it? Do you get a feeling about about when, what point people want to downsize? Like if you're now you you've thought about the money, when's the time to sell your family home? In the experience of the people you tend to speak to, yeah. Look, it's personal for everybody, and the time has to be right for you. You will know. Um, I think there's two factors in it. 
One is people sometimes defer the decision because they're overwhelmed by the, um, they're trying to find the right information to make the right decision. So what I would say is be proactive and go and shop, go and suss out the opportunities for you. Um, while you're fit, able, and, and if you're going to move to a new, connect, a new community, you're really willing to want to connect with new friends. The physical downsize is also immense, but um, I think in terms of, you know, post-COVID, people are saying, do I sell now? Do I defer selling? What's going to happen in the market? Because this is your biggest asset um, and you want to make sure you're cashing out of it and getting as much money as you can. And look, the one thing I would say is, um, you know, there was great, great data released by CoreLogic yesterday. We've got a bit of a perfect storm right at the moment um, where there's really low supply levels on the market. Um, there's low interest rates. The property market is seeing really significant buoyant growth off the back of the low supply at the moment. We're not sure what's going to happen. The midterm of falling migration rates and immigration and unemployment um, and when the incentives cease, we're not quite sure what impact that's going to have on the property market. But right at the moment, you can see here in these graphs, um, November's seeing a really big uplift in auction clearance rates. It's almost back to normal levels off the lower um, volumes. Um, and you know, there's very limited listings. So some people are coming to us and saying, hey, we want to we want to cash out now. We think this is the time. Our kids have had a financial challenge and we want to have some cash in the bank to be able to help them if we need. Um, or if the kids lose their job through the economic recovery, we just want a bit more of a buffer. So um, look, we're seeing a very proactive approach by people um, to try to use this, this perfect storm window at the moment to capitalise out of their homes. It was a fair, they, those, those core logic um, numbers were fairly amazing and showed how resilient broadly the Australian property market market is. We, we did look at those. Um, but have, um, having sold or thinking about selling is half the, half the issue. Rachel, I know that you advise people on this topic all the time. Um, what, do you, what do you need to think about Next, as well as as well as selling the, the family home, what do what do people need to consider on finances and otherwise? Well, I mean, the biggest question obviously is where are you moving to? Um, and when it comes to downsizing, there's there's lots of different options. So um, some people will downsize into a strata title um, unit or or an apartment or even just a, a smaller home. Um, I guess. We see that work well and, and not so well. It, you can't control your neighbours and your neighbours don't necessarily enjoy the same lifestyle that you do. So uh, I know that in my family, my mum has downsized into the Docklands down here in Melbourne and, and for the most part, she loves it. Uh, but at this time of year when the schools break up and there's Christmas parties and things like that and there's a lot of apartments on Airbnb, um, it doesn't necessarily make for a good night's sleep. So... Um, I guess you, you know if you um, if you want to control your neighbours, you can't really do that uh, in a strata title um, development or or even in a in a, in a smaller home um, where you have title. For some people, the the aim will be to live with family, and whether they know it or not, they may be establishing what they call a granny flat. Right. Um, my my advice to most people who who want to go into these arrangements, first of all, is don't. Um, second of all, if you have to know that they are the most complex, so they are far more complex than moving into a retirement village or a land lease community, partly because um, the contract needs to take into consideration so much more, um, but also because you're contracting with family. And so it becomes very difficult, uh, you know, to have a, a commercial agreement. Some people will choose to rent in retirement. Um, and there is a, a, a number of rental. A lot of people think, oh, if I move into a, a retirement community, uh, I'm going to have to purchase. I'm going to have to pay a big amount up front and then an exit fee at the end. That's not true. There are retirement communities that don't charge exit fees. And there are also retirement communities where you can pay a weekly rent instead of needing to pay a, a big lump sum up front and an exit fee at the end. So that that's worth considering. But I guess uh, for the purpose of today, we'll focus on retirement communities and really I'm bunching two things into uh, into one there in that um, when we're talking about retirement communities we're talking about retirement villages and land lease communities uh, it's kind of like saying fruit 
they're, they're both fruit, uh, but one's an apple and one's an orange. So um, when it comes to land lease communities, you buy your home. Uh, and as Kate showed in those pictures, and I think it's great to have pictures like that because I think sometimes the mental image that people get is very different to what they find when they actually go to visit uh, one of these communities. And I would encourage anyone who's considering moving into, whether it's a retirement village or a land lease community, to go and look at what the options are because what you think is on offer and what you may find is on offer could be two very different things, both in, in terms of the homes, but the other images Kate showed as well with the resort style facilities, a lot of people think they're on a permanent vacation. So in a land lease community, you buy that home and you lease the land on which it sits. In a retirement village, there's a number of different contract structures, but most of them are either a leasehold or a license to occupy arrangement. There are some strata title, there's some company title and things like that, but the overwhelming majority of contracts are either a leasehold or a license. When it comes to the ongoing amount in a land lease community, you pay either a weekly or monthly fee that's called site fees. In a retirement village, it's normally called a general service charge or a recurrent charge. In a land lease community, um, typically if you are if you qualify for the age pension or, or a similar pension, then you can claim rent assistance on those site fees. In a retirement village, there's special rules. So you still need to be eligible for a pension, but you also need to have paid less than what they call the extra allowable amount, which at the moment is $214,500. So if you pay less than that, then you can qualify for rent assistance in a retirement village. If you pay more than that, then you won't qualify for rent assistance in a retirement village. And obviously retirement villages normally have an exit fee. So when we're talking about exit fees, um, anything between zero and 100 is possible. Um, but anything between sort of 25% and 40% is, if you like, common. And then it's really a question of, um, is it, let's say it's 30%, just to use a, a figure, um, is it 30% of your original purchase price, in which case you always know what it is, or is it 30% of your selling price? And then sometimes there can be sharing in capital gain and capital loss. And sometimes those two things are not the same. So sometimes you might share in capital gain 50-50, but you receive 100% of any capital loss. And then there's other selling costs that can go with it. Um, and, and often these selling costs apply to any home. So home in a land lease community, a home in the community, an apartment, anything, which is things like agents, commissions, uh, marketing fees. And, and sometimes depending on how long you've lived there, you may need to do some uh, refurbishment of the property before you sell it to make sure that you're getting the, the best price. That sounds um that sounds uh, that's a really great look at uh, look at the different options. Can you um is there anything else we need to know about the Centrelink treatment of the various properties? Uh, well. I guess the thing to know is that in a land lease community, it, it doesn't matter how much you pay for your home, you're always considered to be a homeowner. Um, but you still qualify for rent assistance because you lease the land on which your home sits. So the same rules apply to caravans and yachts. So it's not really about the price that you're paying. In fact, it's not about the price that you're paying for your home. Um, if your home was a million dollar yacht, obviously you would need to moor that million dollar yacht. And if you qualified for the pension, Centrelink would pay you rent assistance on your mooring fees. It's the same concept. You're mooring your house on someone else's land. It just happens to give you access to all these wonderful facilities and amenities and community and everything else that goes with it. But because you are mooring that house on someone else's land, you can claim rent assistance on those site fees. In a retirement village, and I do apologise, these figures uh, are out of date, but in a retirement village, the amount you pay determines whether or not you're considered a homeowner or not. So if the amount that you pay is less than the, the current figure is $214,500, if the amount you pay is less than $214,500, you're classified as a non-homeowner. And what that means is that whatever amount you've paid for your unit in the retirement village gets included in your pension assets. 
but it, it doesn't have a negative effect because as a non-homeowner, you get an extra $214,500 in your asset test threshold. So there's no detriment from that point of view. And under those circumstances, as a non-homeowner, you can claim rent assistance. But if the amount that you pay is more than $214,500, you'll be classified as a homeowner and you won't be eligible for rent assistance in a retirement village under that set of circumstances. And I'm assuming also the other thing that you have to think about is not just the Centrelink treatment, but whether the community actually works for you. Um, how do you how do you recommend uh, anyone considering any kind of um, downsizing work out whether it's the right place for them? Okay, so there's two things. First of all, it's all about the vibe. <laughs> and second of all, you've got to find your tribe. So you've got to make sure that the community is going to offer you uh, essentially the lifestyle that you're looking for. So what, how do you want to spend your days? What activities are you interested in? Where, where do you want to live in terms of location, proximity to family? All of those sorts of things. You've got to work all of that out. But then you've also got to work out whether or not um, these people are your tribe. And, and the best way to do that, um, honestly, is go to a happy hour. So at the happy hours is where you get the good oil. That's where you get to meet the people who already live in the community and you get to ask them questions about what is it like, what do people do, you know, what, what's the manager like, all of those sorts of things. And you will really find out so much more information to, to get a sense of, you know, to do your research and work out which communities you're interested in. Sure, you, you, you attend the open days and you um, look at the websites and you take a tour and you do all of that. But at the end of the day, when you really want to work out, is this, am I going to be, you know, a round peg in a round hole or a square peg in a square, in a round hole at this community, you, you go to the happy hours or the barbecues or whatever it is that they put on where you get to meet other residents who live in that community. That's such, those, those are such great points. And I think there's also um, nothing like a, uh, nothing like hearing it from the people who know. Um, I'll leave Kate to introduce our, um, our guest though today who can give um, everyone who's listening in some fantastic insights um, into what it's like to make the downsizing decision. I can't hear you. Kate's muted. Kate's muted. Hey Kate, I think we're um you you may be on mute. My apologies. Oh, we've got you. No, no, it's all sorry. good. We can hear you now. I'm in an office when and they were slamming the door next door, so I'm sorry, guys. Um, I just wanted to say a very big warm welcome to Di. Uh, Di joined one of our communities down in Lara in Melbourne, and Di's got a really interesting story, I suppose, around what drove her to have to consider downsizing. Um, and selling her home, what attracted her to look at this particular community. And it might be worthwhile you sharing with people what has happened since you moved in and how that has shifted, you know, the social engagement and the connection has actually shifted and impacted on your life. Um, I won't steal your thunder because it's quite a beautiful <laughs> story, Di. Thanks, Kate. Hello, everybody. Um, yeah, I found myself in a situation about uh, four years ago, early 2016, uh, my husband and I decided to separate. And uh, it was a it was a pretty, pretty dreadful time, obviously, with uh, that situation. And we already lived in Lara and had watched uh, the Ingenio Lifestyle Village being built. And at that time, of course, we had to put our home on the market. And uh, all of a sudden I had this, these big decisions to make for myself. And it was, where am I gonna go? Um, where am I gonna live? What's gonna happen? So I decided to go and have a look at the, uh, the Lara Lifestyle community. And I, the three, three main important things for me were, could I afford it? Was it safe? And would I fit in? 
And after going in and having a look and speaking to the staff, yes, I could afford it. The homes were terrific. I had a look at the wonderful facilities that were on offer. And I was still in Lara in a suburb that I was um, felt at home in. So for me, that was a, a, a tick the boxes straight away. And then I went uh, home and I was speaking with my husband and, you know, because we were trying to sell our house and just work out our, our individual plans. And I said to him, where do you think you'll go? And he said, well, I've been thinking of the Lara Lifestyle Village. And I said, well, guess where I've been today? I've been to the Lara Lifestyle Village. And I, all of a sudden I thought, oh my God, you know, now he's gonna be my neighbor. Um, so he was a bit uncertain, but still put his deposit down. And uh, once our home had sold and, and uh, I moved straight in. So I moved in in September of 2016, um, immediately made wonderful friends. They, they wrapped their arms around me. Um, I just felt like I've, I, I was going to fit in there. And I think one of the, the special things I think that made a difference uh, when my son and daughter had a look around the village too and met my neighbours, um, they said, Mum, you're going to be okay, aren't you? And I said, yes, I am. Yes, you know. And that's a big thing, I think, with what um, we were going through. Um, anyway, it, it didn't end there. I, I, you know, got quite involved with the village. I'm happy to speak to anyone who wants to come in and just ask any residents any questions about how it made me feel and it was very, very important. So um, lo and behold, about nine months later, my husband actually took off in the caravan. He, he was still making his mind up as to whether to move in or not. And about nine or so months later, he did decide to move in and he was four doors away. So yes, he was my neighbor, <laughs> um, which was a bit awkward, but still he got him very involved with uh, the men's group and just making his own social group of friends. I had ladies and, you know, we'd go out for lunch, go out to the movies. And um, over the few months, we'd run into each other and just say hi. And there was, you know, you were always doing that at the village. And um, I got a bit ill and uh, my husband then found out that I hadn't been well and come over and caught up with me. And um, long story short, we got back together. So we... Uh, sold our individual homes and bought another one. So we've been through the process of, of buying and selling and buying. And uh, we're, we're really, really happy. Uh, the community here has just made such a difference as we've both seen it from a single um, person's point of view. Now, as a couple, again, um, we go away on holidays, we get involved in what's going on in the community. Um, there's always something to do. I can remember going and checking the mail. My, my record for checking the mail is three hours. I go over to the central mail area and check the, check the mail and then you go into the clubhouse, um, have a cup of see who's there and it was three hours before I got home one day. It's, it's just amazing. Di, it's, um, it's quite a heartwarming story and I think it plays to the um, the fact that, you know, change is confronting and, and when people are facing retirement and, you know, maybe stopping working, their dynamic and relationship with their kids change at this chapter too, mm -hmm. their friendship groups somewhat shift. I often find women say, you know, as their husband may retire if she's been at home, um, you know, I married him for breakfast and dinner, not for lunch. <laughs> I don't quite know how this relationship's going <laughs> to evolve through this. And, um, yeah. You know, they are the realities of relationships. and um, But I, th I think it's a really beautiful story um, that really articulates a couple of things. One is um, one of the things that you said to us that really attracted you to it, particularly given you had this division of finances that you had to try and accommodate, was that there was, it was very unique in Melbourne at the time, there was no exit fee. So, you know, you've worked very hard you've had a business and you've worked very hard and you want to hold on to those funds and not pay an exit fee mm -hmm. what were the things that attracted you to Lara compared to something else from the, in terms of the model uh it was I'd heard stories about other um retirement um setups that 
you know, the exit fees would make a difference at the other end. And I mean, as a mum of, of two gorgeous kids, um, it was important that the, the financial side, you know, there, there had to be a better way. And the, the Lara community, um, ingenia community set that up. It was set up. And as I said, we've been through the process. Um, everything was as laid out. And, and that's pretty important because, you know, it's, it's got to be something that um, a parent can leave to their children. Um, but we still get the advantage of enjoying everything that it's, it's set up for us there while we're, the, while we're here. Yeah. And I think the other thing is, um, Di, the, it is that social connection. I think, you know, when we've seen your husband get really engaged with things, it's, it's, it's mm. amazing, again, back to we're social beings. We need to be yeah. connected and yeah. engaged. And, and I think it's recognising that transition and taking ownership of how important social connection and activity and a sense of purpose is to our health and wellbeing and our happiness um, in, yeah. in what should be the best years of our life because you work very hard for them. We, we, we have conversations of a nice, you know, like pre-COVID, obviously, it's been a lot, a lot different this year, but pre-COVID, it'd be, well, what are you doing tomorrow? Oh, well, I'm doing this, this and this. I'm going to have a game of pool and I'm going to do this and I'm going out for lunch with the ladies. And um, the funniest thing is I, I can come home from, from shopping. Uh, his car will be here, but he's not. So he could be anywhere in the village. He could be at, you know, half a dozen friends' houses, he could be playing pool. He could be in the pool. So um, I know he's here somewhere, and and that's our life. We sort of cross over and we we join together. Um, uh, Sunday soirees are our thing. We have a every fortnight we have a Sunday soiree. We all go over there to the clubhouse. We take our nibbles and our wine, um, and we could be over there for ages. And the best part about it, no one has to drive home. We all, we all, <laughs> no RBT. <laughs> we all we all just go home and there's there's no drama and you know it's just a lot of fun it's you know a positive community I, I can't speak highly enough of it. Di thank you for that and one of the things that people often ask us is when they're considering it it's how do they compare the cost of staying in their own home versus moving into an option a lifestyle community of some sorts um, and, you know, Rachel's been doing an enormous amount of work on, on a tool that can help people because, you know, it's great to hear from Rachel about what you need to consider, but it's then translating that into what does that actually mean for me? And so we've been working closely with Rachel and we're excited that in the coming months we'll be able to share with people a great tool that lets them really compare those costs and bring it home. And, um, for any of you um, that are considering it, we will share with you following this um, a bit of a roadmap that spells out the journey that Di's been on, um, the journey that you need to consider and many of the things that have been raised in today's session. And I do encourage you to have a cuppa, sit down and just take some time out to imagine what your future should be. I think COVID has been very confronting for all of us and... Um, I encourage you to, you know, get back in that driver's seat of life and, and orchestrate and, and become the designer and architect of the next chapter for you because I think when, when we hear stories like Di's, it's, um, it is heartwarming and it's, um, it's an opportunity that we all have. And, and as I say, if going on the journey means that staying in your own home is the right thing for you too, then that's a deliberate decision and there's a peace of mind that comes with that decision too. I was going to ask, Kate, sorry, sorry to... <laughs> ask a question Christine but I was going to ask whether Di had crunched the numbers on you know I mean making that move in in a in a different if you had have made a different decision if you had have decided to downsize into two strata um, homes or if you had have decided to downsize into a retirement village have you actually worked out the fact that you moved into a land lease community where you don't have to pay stamp duty on purchasing, you don't have to pay an exit fee to sell. Have you actually looked at, and, and if you haven't, I'm happy to run these numbers just purely out of curiosity because, you know, I love crunching numbers on these things. But I'd be interested to know what what the, if you had have done it differently, what the cost of that would have been. So how much money have you 
have you saved in stamp duty or exit fees as a result of two and 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 would that um, cost have actually prevented you from being able to sell two homes and move into one because it's all well and good to say sell two homes and move into one but if if you're going to pay stamp duty going in and then you know stamp duty again or if you're going to pay an exit fee it, it might not be possible to fund that have you have you run those numbers we didn't actually run the numbers rachel but um the decision was sort of made for us because we both enjoyed being here uh, and the process was made so easy, it wasn't an issue for us. It wasn't an issue. This is where we wanted to stay. Um, and of course, the, the, the fact that, you know, we were, we were here already, um, I, we didn't want to leave. We didn't want to leave. It was, it's that simple. Yeah, we didn't want the lovely to thing though, Di, is without the exit fees, you've had the op the flexibility mm. to be able to say, you know, let's re-explore reuniting into one home together without, you know, having that impost of, oh, we actually have now made this decision. We're financially locked in now. We can't, don't have that flexibility to sell out and to reunite into one larger home. And um, I know you chose one of our larger homes that's got, lots of alfresco entertaining and lots of natural yeah. light and um you know to have that flexibility we see very important we do find people will move into a community and then grandchildren will have a baby up the coast and we've had lots of people move from say latitude one at port stevens to um one of our communities at cost harbour and we've got people that are trading in and out as their needs change or you know, or conversely buy in with their partner with a double garage and a large three bedroom home. And in time, you know, their needs change and they've downsized again and cashed out a second time. Um, so that flexibility is, is you know, quite paramount. Rachel, it'd be great um, if we could get you to crunch some numbers and I might um, I'd be interested ask to do it just out of, you know, share <laughs> some scenarios in a follow up EDM or a follow up um, email to everyone that just, I think the difference scenarios. could be tens of thousands of dollars, you know, if oh. you factor in stamp duty. I mean, stamp duty is not cheap. And then, yeah, I mean, we could look at it from a couple of different points of view if you downsized into something that was, you know, strata, whether it was a unit, apartment, a house, or if you downsized into a retirement village and just look at those numbers. I think you'll be amazed how much money um, there is in that, Di. Yeah. You yeah. know it's dangerous to go uh, talking about possible uh, possible more data uh, for, for with a, a media a media person here. We will definitely follow up. On, okay, so you want an on article that. on that too? No problem. Yes, yes, we do, and it'd we'll be make at least sure. A, it would be at least one hundred thousand dollars or more. No question. Yeah, I've I, I, like stamp I duty right. selling commission. Yeah, hundred thousand at the minimum. Yeah. Okay. That's a good anyway. holiday. Anyone listening? Oh, that's several holidays. That's a holidays. caravan. <laughs> so anyone well, listening? it's not much of a caravan. They're, they're going to be doing that article. <laughs> I'm only kidding. We'd be very, we'd be really happy to help you pull that together and um, share it with everyone who's listening and anyone who might, um, who might be interested. Uh, thank you so much, Diane, for sharing your story. That's, that's an amazing one. Mm -hmm. I've, we've got about only about 10 minutes left and we have got some questions from the people who are listening um, listening in. Very quickly, um, I'll ask, um, I've got one quick one for Kate, which is someone listening wants to know, when are you coming to South Australia? Is Ingenia there? Are they planning on going there? What's the story on um, SA? Um, really good question. I had a six hour strategy session with our board yesterday on geographic expansion because you know this this sector is growing so exponentially fast and um, we fortunately have a lot of capital to to deploy. We are looking at geographically diversifying. Um, I can't say that we've got something in South Australia at the moment, but it's well and truly on the agenda. Um, because the demand for this, this simple model is, um, is really growing exponentially. Now, it's just a great thematic. It's about the affordability, cashing out and getting money in the bank. So we would love to see you in South Australia shortly. I can't promise that it's immediate, but I will give that feedback. Thanks, Kate. And I, I know as a listed company, there's only probably so much you can give away. So uh, we really appreciate you, um, you addressing that one. 
Now, um, this is a, a tricky one, and it's um, I'm going to ask Noel if you mind addressing. Can you explain? And it's it's not it's it is very intrinsic to the downsizing decision. Can you explain the differences between a reverse mortgage and what people might have known as home reversion or what is now called equity release? Okay, when you take out a reverse mortgage, it's a simple loan with no repayments of principal or interest. There are no other issues. I think the Bendigo Bank in certain suburbs, not everywhere, you can sell them part of your house uh, and, and, and then you keep the house and some and you sell part of your house. It was described by Paul Keating as eating your house recently. Uh, I guess that's the main difference. In a reverse mortgage, you borrow against your house, so you've got a growing debt. In the, equi in the equity release, someone takes over part of your house and then you've got all the troubles of joint ownership. I think the downsizing model is so simple. That, that's, a, that's a really succinct way of putting it. Thanks, Noel. And now I've got to jump back to Kate because um, we've, got a, we've got a viewer who has asked, what provision, if any, do land lease communities make for people living with disabilities or who develop a disability later in life while they're living in the community? Are, say, communities accessible? Can you have a, a property built with features that might meet, uh, meet specific needs? Can you talk to that for us? Yes, absolutely. And look, I think um, we all of our homes are designed as much as we can to age in place. They're not all necessarily um, fully um, disabled um, appropriate, but they're definitely um, adaptable. So all doors are wider than normal. Our flush holds, are, uh, our thresholds are flush. We have a very innovative uh, construction methodology, unlike a lot of land lease communities, where our, a lot of our homes sit flush on the ground, there's no steps. And all of that has been designed to enable people with mobility issues to age in place. The other thing we're very mindful of is, as again, as these boomers are coming through, they're shifting the psyche. They don't want to downsize and not have a continuum of care model. So Ingenia has responded very innovatively People can move into a lifestyle, one of the ingenious communities. Our homes, as I say, are designed for ageing in place and for your mobility challenges. Um, but the additional thing is we have an, a, a program called Care Assist, which is a really innovative program that is really your care concierge and you can dial up and dial down care as and when you need into the future. So if somebody's younger and moving in wants to lock and leave and travel, it may not be top of mind. But what we're seeing is boomers who have recently had to put mum and dad somewhere, they're really, really cognizant of how adaptable that bathroom layout is to having a care, carer come in and help you at home if you need that in the future or if your needs change. So all of our designs have thought those issues through um, and give you, again, it's that flexibility to be able to stay in your home um, and age as circumstances change as and when you want to. Thanks, Kate. And this is, this is an aligned question we've received from actually a, a different viewer. Um, and it is great that Care Assist can come into your own home and allow you to live independently there for as long as possible. Um, if, the, if, that, if you come to a point in which that's no longer possible and you do need residential aged care, um, there's two questions. Are you aligned with any residential aged care providers? And also, if someone needs to go into residential aged care, is there any way of knowing how long it may take to sell their, their, their house in the community so they, can, so they can make that move? So I'll answer the second part first. And Thanks. then, um, so the second part is, is it easy to sell your home in a lifestyle community? Because it's important to be able to access yeah. that cash. One of the things that some more traditional retirement communities do is there is limitations on who and how you can sell it. Ingenia has no limitations on it. You can sell through um, Ingenia and we hold very big databases and wait lists for a lot of homes um, and you get 100% of any capital growth. Um, so it would cost you the cost of an agency fee. 
um, or you can go and use an external agent however you choose to cash out. So we've tried to simplify and give you control around that. To the first part of the question, we don't have an alliance specifically with an aged care provider. We're not an aged care provider. Our care concierge has a facility to fast track your um, assessments. Um, but I think, and Rachel can talk to as the aged care guru that you are, um, there's such a shift coming in terms of um, a, people will be going to aged care for shorter periods of time in more crisis periods moving forward and the government funding will actually be with you to bring services into your home as an increasing trend moving forward. So um, we had a fantastic presentation on it yesterday. But Rachel, you are the aged care guru. I will um, let you talk about some of the things that are shifting in terms of person-centred care. Yeah, look, and I think it's a bit of a misnomer, you know, Kate. I think, I think the media have done a fantastic job of perpetuating this myth that aged care equals nursing home. And if you need aged care, you have to move into a nursing home. And I, I think the Royal Commission has debunked a few myths around that because I think that, that there's been sort of expectations around that, that if I have very high care needs, I have to move into aged care, into a residential aged care facility, or um, if I move into residential aged care, I'm going to get more care, or I'm going to get better care, I'm going to get more better care. Uh, if, and, and I think the Royal Commission has shown that that's not true. There, there were more than 1.3 million Australians who received aged care services last year, and only about 250,000 received that care as a permanent resident of an aged care facility. So it's, it's not the choice that most people are making. Most people want to stay at home. And that's why I, I'm not sure which viewer it was that asked that question about care, but that's why you need to ask that question. Because when it comes to retirement communities, I always say to people that they're kind of on a spectrum. You've got carefree communities and the contract will say, if you need care, you need to leave. You've got care communities that are set up to be 24 hours a day, seven days a week, very much like residential aged care. And you've got everything in between from if you need care, it's your own home, sort it out yourself as you would in any other home, through to programs like Ingenia who say, well, no, we've got people who can help you navigate that maze because you need to know where to zig and where to zag. So make sure you ask that question because for a lot of people, the downsizing decision is a really big decision and they typically make that decision and not want to move again. So uh, even though you might not need care now, just ask the question, what happens if I need care? And it might be that you don't necessarily need care. There's a bit of a perception that if you need care, you'll need care forever and ever, amen. But it might just be that you need care to recover from two new knees, like Noel got a few years ago, you know, from playing too much golf. But, it, it, <laughs> might, but you know, it might not necessarily be that you need somebody to assist you you know, every day or every week for the rest of your life. You might just need that assistance to get back up on your feet, pardon the pun, and then you're right, you don't need the care anymore. So just ask that question, what happens if I need care? Because the answers will vary from one community to another. That's a fantastic and As Di will Thank tell you, you, there's been incidents at Lara where if somebody needs to go to hospital to have a knee or a hip replacement, um, we in junior care will put in place care and services that can organise home work, um, bathing, um, shopping, getting you to the doctors, all of those things that the nice thing is if you can have somebody else do it, it frees up that obligation on your own children and enables you to make sure that the relationship with your children is, is one of love and cherishing and, and you've got time to enjoy with them, not that they're running around doing all the jobs for you all the time. And that, again, plays to your sense of independence. That's another great point. Thanks, Kate. We're almost out of time. We're going to actually run over a little bit because I really want to uh, be able to ask a last few questions that we've received. Um, this is the, the right at the other end of the spectrum, which is, and it's one for you, Kate, do you have to be 100% retired to move into an engineer community? Absolutely not. And we are, uh, you know, Di will tell you, Di, you know, We've got some incredible people living in our communities that are either in paid work or unpaid work, doing some incredible things and really still contributing to, 
you know, in so many ways. So no, I, um, a lot of our um, residents are still actively working one, two days a week, some full time, but have chosen to, at the same, same time, cash out of their home and start ticking off that bucket list while they're still working. And we're seeing that as an increased trend. That is, that's, that's amazing to hear. And the, this is, okay, we're swapping right from each end of the spectrum here. And now we go right to the end of life. Can, someone is asking, can you leave your, your, your um, land lease community dwelling to your family in your estate or do they have to sell because they won't necessarily be over 55? So part of, um, I suppose, the protection, and Rachel talked earlier about the importance of living somewhere where you've got like 900 neighbours and you may not get that in the apartment with the Airbnb teenagers next door. But um, so, yes, you can will your asset to your family. Um, it's a willable asset. If they're over 55, they can easily move into it and the lease transfers. If not, um, if they're not over 55, it would be on sold and they would do it as they normally would with the financial assets that come from the sale. Um, and that's, that's a bit of your protection that you're not going to live somewhere and have the noisy teenagers moving next door. And also protection for your family because it means that they are not um, left with a property that has um, fees ongoing, say, that they would, ha that they would have to meet. So it's, it's protection both ways. Um, I've got one, um, one more quick question for Diane. Um, Diane, you're obviously quite a, a social person who, who is really happy to chat to neighbours and everyone in the community. What's your experience like for the people who, who like their own personal time? You know, can it be, do you still get that, the, the, the quiet downtime, the, the time when you just want to have some time to yourself and you don't feel like having a chat at the mailbox? Is that okay? Absolutely. Um, we tend to utilise our beautiful clubhouse as often as we can, because that gives you the opportunity of gathering in a central space, uh, for example. And then when you've had enough, you just say goodbye and you go home to the privacy of your own home. So we utilize the facilities that are here. So yes, you can get your downtime, absolutely. That, that's great. And I'm afraid that's all we have time for today. Um, so I would love to thank our amazing panel. Um, thanks so much for taking the time to talk to us. Um, Diane, thank you for, for being the special guest and coming on. Um, it's, I think it's been great to hear your real story. And it's a pretty amazing one. Um, it's a good one. It's it, good is, one. It, it is good. And of course, I'd like to thank Ingenia Lifestyle, Australia's premium operator of lifestyle communities for over 50s for organising this webinar. Um, you can find out more about Ingenia at ingenialifestyle.com.au and I will spell that out just um, in case I'm speaking too quickly. It's I-N-G-E-N-I-A-L-I-F-E-S-T-Y-L-E.com.au. And now, of course, I'd like to say thank you to everyone else who's tuned in today. Um, you'll be getting an email in the next few days with a link to this video, of, a video of this webinar, so you can watch it back and pick up on any points that you might have missed, um, share it with other people if you think they might be interested. Um, and in the meantime, stay, um, stay healthy and happy and safe and have a lovely Christmas, everyone. Um, we will be definitely seeing you for um, more informative chats in the new year. And Christine, wow. just a big thank you to those quality questions that we just had. Um, if you have any of the addresses or people, people that ask the questions have their addresses, we'd love to share Noel's new book as a thank you to those people that asked a question. Um, it's I, well worth reading. <laughs> Don't worry, Noel. Um, I am I'm sure we'll be able to <laughs> arrange some copies. Um, it, I know it's in demand, though. I believe you are close to selling out so we'll have to get in fast very well very well indeed <laughs> thank you it does make a good christmas gift though <laughs> thank you all so much for your time and we'll thank you christine thanks thank you bye thanks, everyone bye